welcome to lecture 21 and in the last lecture we are discussing about premixed claims and one very important property of premixed claims is its laminar burning velocity. So, we introduce this, we call this S L, S subscript L, S L is the wave speed, uh, but for the laminar case and this is uh, the same as the velocity with which the unburnt mixture moves into the flame relative to the flame, normal to the flame when the conditions are laminar. Now, there is a particular reason why for laminar situations the burning velocity is very important. S L that is the laminar burning velocity is in fact a property of the mixture. So, what I mean by that is that if you consider a flame which is stabilized on a tube like a Bunsen flame or maybe if you consider a flame which is propagating in a spherical chamber, in a chamber uh, as a spherical flame or maybe as a cylindrical flame, whatever. So, if it is a burner stabilized flame or maybe it is a, it is an expanding flame or it is a flame which is, which is a planar flame which is moving through a mixture, whatever it is, whatever kind of flame configuration is you have, as long as the flow situation is laminar, the burning velocity which is laminar burning velocity is a property of the mixture. That means, it will not change depending on the configuration that you have. The fact that flame is of a conical nature on a Bunsen burner or maybe the flame is planar moving through a mixture in a tube or maybe there is an spherically expanding flame. In all these different kind of configurations, as long as we are confident that the flow situation is laminar and the flame is moving smoothly, the burning velocity has this is the same value for a particular mixture. So, it does not change from one configuration to another. So, that gives it uh, more importance and this is uh, what is called the property of the mixture. Now, in contrast, if the flow situation was turbulent, then the burning velocity is not a property of the mixture. It is affected by the flow characteristics. So, since it is a property of the mixture, we are quite interested in getting laminar burning velocity. Now, since it is a property, what I am saying is, suppose we fix a mixture, suppose this is a methane air mixture uh, with an equivalence ratio of 1 and unburned temperature of 300 Kelvin, pressure of 1 atmosphere then the laminar burning velocity is supposed to be about 37 centimeter per second. So, this will not change if you change the burner or if you change the flow configuration. That is the importance of this. The other importance we already discussed. We said that laminar burning velocity S L relates to consumption rate of the mixture, because ultimately we know that m dot double prime must be equal to rho u into S L. This we did some time back. So, if you have the unburnt density multiplied by a relative velocity of the unburnt gases with respect <coughs> to the flame, then you get a mass flux. So, so S L determines the mass flux. S L is a property of the mixture. So, we know this mass flux can be determined once we have S L and mass flux is important in various applications because let us say you have a burner then what you are interested in is the rate at which the mixture is going to get consumed because the rate at which it gets consumed will relate to the rate at which heat will get released chemical energy, chemical energy the fuel will get released in the form of thermal energy and that, that heat might be used to heat something on a burner or maybe if it is an engine kind of application, then it will be determining the rate of consumption of the fuel air mixture and hence relate to the power produced by the engine. Of course, in an engine the flow situation is turbulent. So, we cannot use uh, this laminar burning velocity. Um, importance of laminar burning velocity straight away, but later on we will see that turbulent burning velocity can also be related to laminar burning velocity. 
So, lamina varying velocity is a property of the mixture that is why it is important. It does not depend on configuration and uh, it also relates to the rate of consumption of the mixture plus we will see later that uh, with if we know laminar burning velocity we may be able to say something about uh, whether for a given velocity or a given flow velocity whether the flame will get stabilized on a burner or not. So, it relates to the stabilization characteristics of the mixture also even ignition characteristics of a mixture and quenching characteristics of a flame. So, we will see all those uh, slowly everything may not be immediately clear to you but SL is actually very important to us. Now, for SL we will do two kinds of theories. One is a very old theory which was given in 18 and 18, 18, 18, 1883 by uh, these two gentlemen. So, this is the simplest possible theory. This is called a thermal theory of laminar premix flames. And with the help of this theory, we can we can learn something about the dependence of SL on the mixture. Let us see how the theory was. So, what they had done was to write a very simple equation for flame propagation. So, for that, we qualitatively plot temperature as a function of x, x is the axial distance. So, again imagine a flame uh, somewhere here and this is the burnt side. So, that is why you get a burnt temperature here and this is the unburnt side. So, that is why you get the unburnt temperature T u here. So, this flame is somewhere here. Around here we say that there is a temperature T i which is an ignition temperature. And from here to here, we can be defined as a preheat zone. This is a preheat zone, and then we have this section which we call a reaction zone. we can call this one delta r and we can call this part delta p h. So, we can write uh, what they wrote Mallard and Rochette earlier and do this sort of a balance. let us see whether we understand this or not. So, on the left hand side we have m dot double prime which is the flux multiplied by C p multiplied by T i minus T u. So, what is this? This must be the heating of the unburnt mixture from temperature T u to the ignition temperature T i. We call T i an ignition temperature. You can see T i here. So, m dot double prime C p T i minus T u is actually a heating. Okay. So, this is an energy associated with heating an unburnt mixture from temperature T u 
2 temperature T i. Now, that is equal to thermal conductivity K multiplied by T b minus T i divided by delta r. So, what has been done is that a conduction flux, this is a conduction flux because this is like Fourier's law. So, K times T b minus T i higher temperature minus lower temperature divided by thickness of the zone. So, that gives you this give this part gives you a temperature gradient multiplied by thermal conductivity, this gives you a heat flux. So, what this equation says is that this there is a heat flux coming this way and that is heating the mixture which is going from T u to T i. What is the rate at which the unburnt mixture is moving into the reaction zone? That is m dot double prime. Okay. It will help if you think of yourself again positioned somewhere over here on the flame and then you will see that the unburnt mixture is actually moving into the flame, moving towards you at the rate m dot double prime. As it moves, since this is a preheat zone, it, it is going up this temperature gradient and getting heated to T i, right. And that is being affected by this heat flow from this side. So, that was the simplest theory that they had done. Now, if you look at the way I have drawn the figures, you will also notice that the preheat zone is shown as a zone which is thicker than the reaction zone. So, does that sound logical? If you think of the reaction rate profile, then uh, what does that mean? It means the rate of reaction plotted as a function of x. If I talk about a reaction rate profile, that is the rate of reaction plotted as a function of x. So, imagine that, imagine that quantity which I have not shown here, but I had shown in a similar plot uh, in the last lecture I think. Okay. So, where will that reaction rate profile be? Where does the reaction take place? In larger, with larger intensity. Does it take place in the preheat zone or does it place in the take place in the reaction zone? Must be in the reaction zone, okay. Uh, but that is obvious from the name, but I do not mean that. I mean, why should, why should reaction be higher in the reaction zone? Temperature is higher, okay. Temperature is much higher. So, the temperature is T i here and the temperature keeps on increasing, ulti, uh, finally it reaches the temperature T b. So, which is almost the adiabatic flame temperature. If, it, if we do not consider much heat loss, uh, it is very close to the adiabatic flame temperature. So, this in this region the temperature is high and we have studied chemical kinetics, we know that the reaction rate actually goes up very significantly if the temperature increases, correct. Remember that small exercise we have done for the energy factor, if you increase temperature by 10 degree, reaction rate maybe goes up by a factor of 2. So, much higher reaction in this zone and that is why this is called a reaction zone and in, in this zone, the reaction will get quickly completed whereas, in the preheat zone, the, we will have a small amount of reaction happening. Okay? So, we expect delta R to be small, much smaller than delta P H. Delta P H is a broader zone where the unburnt mixture slowly gets heated up. Okay. <laughs> they, they took into account the heat flow from this region which preheats the mixture. What did they did not take into account? They did not take into account the fact that apart from heat, there is also flow of radicals and active species from the reaction zone towards the preheat zone, which helps um, the flame to move, right. So, I am trying to connect to the discussion that we had in the last class some time back, where I said that the flame moves by heating up and transferring active chemical species in the mixture that is ahead of it. 
correct. So, that is how it moves. So, that mechanism is not fully captured by this equation that you see. It takes care of only the thermal aspect. So, that is why this is called a thermal theory. It is not talking about chemically active species. Okay. Now, what is our interest here? We want to say something about what S L is like. What does S L depend on? But where is S L? In this equation, S L is hidden in m dot double prime because m dot double prime is rho u into S L. So, with a slight bit of work which you can quickly do, we can say that S L is So, that is S L and this has a reaction zone thickness. So, we have to do something about it, we do not know directly so much about it. So, we say that there is a reaction time tau r which is delta r divided by S L. So, this has this delta r reaction zone thickness we still do not know much about it and in order to make it more tractable, we write a reaction time which is delta r divided by S L. So, should this be time delta r by S L should this be time? It can be time, yeah it can be time because delta r is the thickness. So, if it has a unit of length S L has a unit of length per unit time. So, this gives you a time. So, we call it a reaction time. So, delta r is tau r into S L and delta r is proportional to S L into 1 over r r. Uh, r r we say that this is a reaction rate. So, we have retained S L, but instead of tau r, we have written 1 over r r, but we have used the proportionality. So, we are not saying that tau r is exactly equal to 1 over reaction rate, but it is proportional to 1 over reaction rate. Do we know this? We have done this in the past, is not it? In the past, we had written an expression for chemical time scale and we had shown that that chemical time scale is actually smaller if the, the reaction rate is higher. We had done that work some time back for bimolecular reaction and for unimolecular reaction is actually even easier. So, broadly we are familiar with this idea that the reaction time must be proportional to 1 over reaction rate. And we have this here, we have this delta r here. So, if you utilize all this, then S L will be proportional to, well this 1 over delta r will become 1 over S L by r r. Okay. So, there are 2 S L's now and that will give you something like this. So, this is the proportionality. Well, we have lost the equality because for tau r we said we did not write an equality for tau r. We said tau r is proportional to 1 over reaction rate. So, you have got this and that means what did I miss? Uh, I did not miss anything, but this has S L, S L here also. So, S L squared basically, S L squared let us move this one, we say S L squared is proportional to this, which will mean 
that S L is proportional to square root of alpha into reaction rate. So, this is alpha which is thermal diffusivity and we got this reaction rate. If we wanted we could have kept this, but we do not again directly know what is T i. So, we are, we are dropping that also. So, S L is proportional to square root of alpha into reaction rate is what Mallard and La Chatelier could give from their thermal theory. Now, this of course, is the simplest possible theory for laminar burning velocity given long time back, more than 130 years back. So, it has limited utility, but the advantage that it has is that it still gives you something which is physically realistic. So, it tells you that if the thermal diffusivity is higher, then the laminar burning velocity will be higher. Now, we can actually see that that should happen, is not it? Because we saw that m dot double prime into C p into T m minus T u is equal to k etcetera. So, you got a k, you got a rho u C p here. So, if k by rho u C p is higher, we expect that the flame propagation will be better, is not it? From this energy balance, just by looking at this, I think we can figure that out. Higher alpha, if that is due to higher thermal conductivity, then of course that will help because then the preheating is better. Okay, the, the this transfer of heat is better, so it will be easier for the flame to move. So we can make conclusions like that, and we can also make this other conclusion that if the reaction rate is higher. the burning velocity should be higher. I mean even intuitively this should be clear to us, because burning velocity has to do with how well the flame can eat through the mixture. right? And if the reaction rate is higher, obviously we expect the burning velocity to be higher. So, that makes sense. Only thing is that Mallard and Lachetilla could successfully give the square root dependence. So, we expect that it will increase with alpha even without doing theory probably you could have guessed it. You also would expect that if the reaction rate is higher then the laminar burning velocity would be higher, but the good thing that they did was they also got the functional dependence of the square root and in reality the square root is a correct dependence. So, better theories of laminar burning velocity will still give you the square root. So, this is a good one. We will, of course, uh, have to see other dependencies of S L. S L, we understand that S L is proportional to square root of alpha into reaction rate, but you, you will expect that the laminar burning velocity should depend on uh, things like pressure, unburnt temperature equivalence ratio things like that. Okay, so, why is the equivalence ratio important? Because if you have a lean mixture it will propagate in one way, if you have a rich mixture it will propagate in some other way. If you have a higher unburnt temp unburnt gas temperature you will expect the flame to propagate better is not it? What does your intuition tell you? I mean if you pre if you have a fuel air mixture and if you preheated it before starting the flame, if you have preheated it, it is given a higher temperature, you will expect the flame to propagate better, is not it? Is all that uh, taken care of in this expression? Well, kind of indirectly that we have to see, because if we increase temperature then we have to see does it does it change reaction rate, does it change alpha, things like that. Okay, so, this expression can do something for us even if you think of the, the more basic quantities like this. Okay. But that we will see later as of now this is good, but 
this is definitely not the best theory that we have. So, we will try to develop a theory following Turns's book. So, this is more sophisticated than Mallard and Lachetelier's theory, but still a very simple theory. Okay. Now, this to do this theory, it will take us some length of time. It will take, you will not be able to finish it today, it will take at least one more lecture to finish this. So, here we will have to work with all conservation equations. We will assume 1 D constant area, steady flow sort of situation. We will assume that the pressure is constant. Now, assumption of constant pressure across the flame is justified, okay, because we have we had done this rankin hugonio we have done this analysis of detonation and deflagration and we saw that when we have a deflagration, there is only a small change in pressure. So, we have been saying that the pressure change is only about 2 percent or so. So, pressure can be taken to be constant, we will assume 1 d flame propagation. So, 1 d constant area steady flow, we will assume properties to be constant, we will take the Lewis number to be equal to 1. Now, what is Lewis number? Lewis number is alpha by d. Alpha is thermal diffusivity and d is mass diffusivity. So, alpha by d mass diffusivity to be equal to 1. We will assume that Fourier's law and Fick's law apply and uh, we will assume binary diffusion. We will assume a single step exothermic reaction. And we will also assume that fuel is completely consumed. <coughs> that is oxidizer is present in stoichiometric or excess amount. So, this is all for our single theory, uh, simple theory. So, I will repeat, uh, we will assume 1 d constant area steady flow, we will neglect changes in kinetic and potential energy, neglect uh, viscous dissipation, neglect also thermal radiation, take Lewis number equal to 1, assume single step exothermic reaction. Assume that Fourier's and Fick's law apply for um, <coughs> heat diffusion and mass diffusion. Take Lewis number to be equal to 1. We will take all individual species specific heats to be constant and equal. So, all species have the same specific heat and that specific heat value it does not depend on temperature. So, then all specific heats are going to be the same. We will take a single step chemical exothermic reaction. So, that means F fuel plus oxidizer giving you products directly in one step. So, we will not assume multiple step chemical reaction. So, these are the assumptions, and these assumptions will tell us that this is a pretty simple theory that we are trying to develop. So, as I said it is uh, 1 d steady 1 d constant area steady flow. So, it is like a flame again propagating like what we had in this one dimensional case. This side is rho u, this side is rho b, the flame is trying to propagate like this. We will assume that m dot double prime is rho u s l equal to constant, because this is a steady situation. So, this is not changing and this is mass conservation. So, 
what is our target? Target is again. Target is actually expression for S L. <coughs> we have to remember one thing here that when we looked at the theory given by Mallard and La Chatelier, it was not exactly an expression, it was a proportionality. So, S L proportional to square root of alpha into reaction rate. So, that is good for us to know how S L depends on thermal diffusivity, how S L depends on reaction rate, but unless we get an equality, we cannot calculate S L. So, now we are looking for an equality. We are trying to get an expression for S L, which will enable us to calculate the value of S L. So, we are interested in calculation. And that calculation was not possible using Mallard and La Chatelier's theory. So, we have this 1 D flame propagation. We know this is correct, okay, because this is steady situation. So, mass conservation will give you just this, that is fine. We know if you have a mixture, if you have a flame, it will propagate, it will consume the mixture, right. We know this is constant, but we do not know how to determine this value. How does the flame decide how much value it can handle? You have a mixture, the flame is propagating, is it is consuming certain m dot double prime. Okay, but what is that value? So, to get that, to get that S L, we need to be able to bring in other conservation equations also. <laughs> so, the other conservation equations so will be, of course, there can be a momentum conservation equation, but in this case, since pressure is constant, it is easy to show that momentum conservation equation will essentially give you pressure equal to constant. Now, the other equations that we will need are species conservation. and energy conservation. <coughs> so, let us try the easier, easier one first is species conservation. If we take a slice like this in the domain, so this is all fuel air mixture and there the flame is propagating. So, let us say we have a slice somewhere there and we are considering a particular species A. Then One D, of course, one dimensional. <coughs> we can write this sort of a species conservation equation. Let us see. This is d d t of mass of A in the control volume. So, that should be uh, dependent on what is going in, what is going out plus another term 
which takes care of the rate of species pro A production in the volume. Correct? So, d d t of mass of A in the control volume is of course, what is going in is this much as you can see from here and what is going out should come with a negative sign. So, this is going in and this is this much is going out going out that is why this is a negative sign plus there is a production term of species A in the control volume. So, the production term is written as m dot a triple prime. So, that multiplied by this v is the volume. Okay. Now, what is this production term? Production term is written as m dot a triple prime that means m dot for per unit time and triple prime to indicate its per unit volume. So, th this is m dot a trip m dot a triple prime which means it is the rate of production of A per unit volume per unit time. How is it getting produced? Must be because of chemical reaction. Does it always have to get generated produced? Not necessarily, it may even get consumed. If it gets consumed there is no problem, then thus m dot A triple prime will have a negative sign in it. So, this is a simple balance which tells you com, uh, coming in minus going out plus generated is equal to rate of change in the control volume. Of course, we are taking this to be a steady flow situation. Our situation is steady. So, we can set this equal to 0 for our case and that will give us this as the species conservation equation for species A or you can write uh, maybe I should write in terms of the I s species. you have got something like this. So, this is species conservation. So, we have two things now. We had mass conservation few minutes back. Our mass conservation was just this and our species conservation is this. Now, we will have to spend little longer on energy conservation, it turns out to be uh, more involved. But before we go to energy conservation, we actually can expand on the species conservation equation. we can try to uh, bring it to another form, another useful form for us. Let us see whether we can figure this out. For m dot i double prime, for this m dot i double prime, I have written this. Okay, so have we seen this before? M dot i double prime is the mass flux of the ith species. The mass flux of the ith species, remember we did some time back, I think while discussing well stirred reactor. 
So, this has two components, it has one component due to bulk flow and the other component is due to a diffusion effect. So, it has a bulk flow component and, the, and a diffusional mass flux component. Okay, so, we wrote m dot double prime into y i as one term and there was another term which was m dot double prime diffusion for the ith species. Okay, so, we we will discuss this I think when we are discussing well start reactor and for well start reactor since it was perfectly well mixed we neglected that diffusion component. Okay, but here we cannot do that because here we have species gradients. So, here we will maintain the diffusion component term and m dot diffusion m dot diffusion i must be rho d d y i d x. So, this part must be the diffusional mass flux. So, where, where do I get this from this expression? fixed law. This must be from fixed law. But D is the diffusion coefficient. Okay, so if you are not comfortable with this, you have to look up the book. Plus, this must have been covered in the convective heat and mass transfer course. So you have to look that up. So this is this takes care of the diffusion and mass flux. So, this is a mass diffusivity or D is a mass diffusivity. Okay. So, we have this and I uh, will just do one, one more small thing, we will write expression for the fuel species conservation equation, oxidizer species conservation equation and product species conservation equation. Okay. So, this is our species conservation equation. Now, in this species conservation equation, how many species are we thinking of? We have this situation now when we have fuel and air mixture and then we have a flame propagating. We said we will try to keep the problem as simple as possible. So, we have fuel, oxidizer and products. It is as if fuel and oxidizer react with each other just in one step giving you products of combustion, that is what we said. So, we have to write species conservation equation for 3 species, not more than that. Lower than 3, of course, not possible. So, we are working with the minimum possible, we are working with 3. So, what can we write for the fuel species equation? Using this, we can write This is a fuel species equation. Okay. And we can write an oxidizer species equation also, which will look very similar. Okay, let, let uh, let us write one more step for this one for fuel species. So, just this equation after carrying out the differentiation. So, this is the fuel species equation. And for oxidizer, we can write very similarly. This 
place. <coughs> so, nothing new for the oxidizer except that we will try to again write this term in terms of m dot f triple prime. So, a chemical reaction is like this. Yeah, we are assuming it to be just char characterized by one or two fusion coefficient. Just a small thing we will try to do now. This is the oxidizer equation, and this is our chemical situation. Fuel plus oxidizer gives you products, and we assume that for 1 kg of fuel, there is mu kg of oxidizer. So, if you have, for example, um, <coughs> methane burning with air. Then you can calculate how much air is required, air is oxidizer, how much air is required for 1 kg of methane, and that is the value of mu that you will get. So, it can be easily calculated. And <coughs> based on this, we can easily see that if we write m dot f triple prime here, then we have to write nu times m, m dot f triple prime here and 1 plus nu times m dot, m dot f triple prime here. So, that means, this must happen. Is it? Because if m dot f triple prime of fuel is getting consumed, then m dot o triple prime of oxidizer must be getting consumed. So, or produced whatever, uh, then this must be m dot o triple prime, is not it? And similarly, using the same argument, this should happen. That means, we identify this as m dot product triple prime. This is ok, except that there is a slight change that we have to make. See, m dot f and m dot o, they should be of the same sign because fuel gets consumed, oxidizer also gets consumed, but we cannot say the same thing about products. So, we have to use a minus sign. Correct? So, numerically this part is ok. Numerically m dot product triple prime must be equal to 1 plus nu into m dot f triple prime numerically but there should be a minus sign, because we understand that m dot f triple prime is supposed to be a production rate, but fuel does not get produced in a combustion reaction. So, m dot f triple prime must be inherently negative. Okay. So, this is negative inherently and you have a negative sign in front. So, together that will give you a positive sign and that is what we expect for m dot product triple prime, because indeed from a real life situation, we understand that m dot product triple prime must be positive. Okay. 
So, what does all this mean? It means that for the oxidizer reaction, oxidizer species, this is ok, but we can also write this to be equal to nu times m dot f triple prime. Why are we doing all this? Convenience, because if we have an expression for m dot f triple prime, then we will just use that. We do not need to have a separate expression for m dot o triple prime. That is the convenience. Okay. So, just to summarize, we did a simple species conservation for 1 D steady flow, we got this one. Then we brought in fixed diffusion, okay, characterized by diffusion coefficient d and then we could develop a fuel conservation equation, fuel species conservation equation like this and very similarly an oxidizer species conservation equation like this. Okay. The only little trick that we have done is that in the oxidizer species conservation equation also we have brought m dot f triple prime just for convenience and why is it convenient will become more clear to us later. Uh, nu is just a number for 1 kg of fuel there is nu kg of oxidizer. So, this is easy thing to get and if we have an m dot f triple prime expression that can be used in the oxidizer species equation. So, we will close shortly for the m dot product triple prime. Yeah. So, 1 kg of fuel and nu kg of oxidizer will react to give you 1 plus nu kg of product. This is the assumption that we are making. Nu is a number which will change from one fuel oxidizer combination to another fuel oxidizer combination. M dot f triple prime bar, m, m dot f triple prime is the production rate per unit uh, volume, you know, per unit volume per unit time for fuel. So, if instead of 1, 1 nu, 1 plus nu, if we have m dot f triple prime here, then it should be m dot f triple prime into nu m dot f triple prime into 1 uh, and here 1 plus nu into m dot f triple prime. This much is ok. All right. Now, just by comparing the situation and remembering our notations, we know that this must be m dot o triple prime. Okay because if this is m dot f triple prime, this must be m dot o triple prime. So, this is ok. Same logic m dot product triple prime must be equal to this, but there is an issue of signs because we know that m dot f triple prime from our basic definition is the rate of production of fuel per unit volume per unit time rate of production of fuel per unit volume per unit time. But we are talking about a combustion reaction. So, the fuel actually does not get produced, it gets consumed. So, m dot f triple prime is inherently negative. What about m dot o triple prime? Again it is getting consumed, so it is inherently negative. So, when it comes to this equation, actually both sides will be negative. So, there is no problem. When it comes to this, when it comes to this equality, this blue thing equal to this black thing, right? There we have to be more careful because numerically m dot product triple prime is equal to 1 plus nu m dot f triple prime. Numerically they are okay, but not fine wise because if you think about it, m dot f triple prime is inherently negative, m dot product triple prime is inherently positive. Why is it positive? Because product of course, is getting produced. Okay. So, it is positive. So, we need a negative sign in order to make the whole thing positive. Okay. So, we are almost running out of time. We will just do one uh, final equation that is for the product. So, m dot double prime This is a product species equation.
So, this part is the product species equation, but then m dot triple prime product is equal to minus 1 plus nu this thing. So, this is also valid. Okay. So, next class we have to do energy equation. Now, just reflect on this for a moment. What did Mallard and Lachette Elliot do? They just did this simple balance of heat transferred from the reaction zone because of the temperature gradient equal to m dot double prime C p T i minus T u. Just that equation. Why are we doing so much then? We are doing so much because we are trying to actually solve for temperature species profiles and then get the get an expression for S L. We are trying to solve for some profiles, whereas theirs was the simplest possible model. So, they, they just had T u, T i, T b. They did not for example, have how temperature varied with x. They did not have how the fuel mass fraction varied with x or the product mass fraction varied with x, things like that. They did not have variations with x. We are trying to do some of those. Okay. That is why our job is going to be is actually more difficult and we are in fact in the next class try to develop energy conservation equation. All right, we will close here. Thank you.